This is Gina Anderson Cohen here on another episode of We Got Goals. We are diving deep into mental health. We're talking about the vocabulary words, the tools, the tips, the tricks, and we're speaking to experts all month long. Today, we are so lucky to have Candice, also known as C. Anderson. She is an author, a licensed therapist. She serves Alabama, Georgia, Washington, DC, and Ohio. Um, She is also the founder and chief executive officer of Revita Therapy and Wellness, which is in Montgomery, Alabama. She has a master's of science in counseling and psychology with a concentration of on clinical mental health from Troy University, aka she knows a lot of stuff. She has been a TEDx speaker. She has so many accolades, I can't even cover them all. She is part of every professional organization and she is the author of a book uh, that we were talking about right before we jumped on to record, which is called Love Taps. I personally think it should be part of everyone's education um, in maybe high school, sex ed, but see, what did I miss? You've done a lot of stuff. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot. I, I literally forget um, all of what I've done. And every time someone reads my bio, I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> um, but some radio, some television, uh, a public service organizations like sororities and such will call upon my expertise for their community outreach program. So that's always fun um, to give back in that way. Uh, organizations like Amazon, um, let's see, the Washington Post, a couple of city governments uh, working with their employees and and things like that. So it's a lot. He knows a lot about trauma uh, and about relationships. And a lot of her work centers on uh, Black women um, and helping folks sort of live in healthy relationships. Is that right, C? Correct. That is absolutely right. And today we're going to spend a lot of time talking about trauma, uh, but we're also going to sort of ground ourselves in the language of trauma. Um, So see, when you and I have had an opportunity to connect before this, BT Dubs, this is coming at you live after the Sweat Working Summit. So you may have already heard from C and you're already obviously in love with her, but C, let us know um, as you look at trauma, how do you sort of define it and how do you talk to folks about trauma? We, We talked about big T and little t. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that uh, I do with my patients is I allow them to define what has been traumatic for them, right? Because everyone has their threshold of response to to incidents um, and uh, their own ability to integrate uh, an incident into their psyche. And so I like for them to see what has happened and then they can say whether or not they felt that it was traumatic. But, you know, clearly there are some instances that are that are just traumatic by nature. Like um, if we talk about big T things. So big T events are those things that most would probably consider traumatic, uh, such as a, um, a car crash or a natural disaster, being in an abusive circumstance, personal, right, or neighborhood, um, if we look at worn, torn countries, those chronic trauma, that would be a big T trauma. But little T trauma are the things that are more personal. So like a relationship that has ended, or maybe your fur baby, right, like your cat or your dog has has passed away. Um, And so it's very much about the response of the person to whatever that stimuli is. And so um, are they having some difficulty coping or do they have full full blown or um, complex PTSD as a result? So that's how we, that's how we, that's how the industry, but then also how I, when I'm doing the work, uh, tend to define trauma. So, um, I mean, trauma is not awesome, but thank you for the definition. The definition was awesome. So as as we're talking about sort of diving into the work, um, you also mentioned PTSD. So can you sort of define like how that looks and how that shows up for people? Sure. So PTSD or post-traumatic, I'm sorry, I've been talking a lot about um, racial uh, trauma. So my brain is kind of stuck in post-traumatic slave disorder, but PTSD, Mm -hmm. post-traumatic Uh, Stress disorder um, has a very specific uh, set of criteria, right, in the DSM. 
Um, but the way that it shows up for a lot of people, you know, for some reason we often think, and I think it might be because TV dramatizes this, but we all, we think PTSD and we immediately think combat, right? We immediately think war, but PTSD truly can be the result, unfortunately, of any sort of trauma, okay? It really depends on that person's brain makeup, their tolerance, um, how their trauma capsules are stored, their ability to integrate the coping skills that they've had prior to the incident um, versus maybe the next person, which is why uh, you have less probability of acquiring P PTSD the sooner you get intervention when an incident happens. Um, and so PTSD for some can look like nightmares, um, constantly in a state of uh, hyper arousal, having flashbacks, feeling as though you are reliving the incident from the, from the sounds, from the smells, from the feel. Um, and that's why certain things in the environment for some can be so triggering because it literally takes that person right back to um, that unfortunate happening. And that, that is, uh, I, I love that you sort of think of, of PTSD as, yes, it's post-traumatic stress disorder, but because your work centers around Black women, um, you also see it as post-traumatic slave disorder. So let's talk a little bit about why um, you found yourself working uh, more so with Black women um, okay. and some men too, and yeah. how, how you kind of how you kind of got there and, and yeah. what, what your work yeah. centers on. Um, so of course, when you're trained, you're trained to work with any population really. And you actually have to identify what populations you rather not work with. So for most people that usually, that usually means um, maybe someone that has been convicted of a very violent crime or someone who has uh, committed crimes against children, things like that. And so in that same vein, you also find the population that you're very drawn to. Um, there's a reason why I don't see children because they would be living in my house, right? So, <laughs> so, um, so I found that in my work and I, and I saw every a bit of everybody as I was training, um, old, young, um, every race, uh, um, ethnicity, faith-based um, from atheist to Wiccan, to Christian, to um, Presbyterian, to agnostic. Like I literally saw everyone. Um, and, and as with anyone, I do the best work that I can do. But I became interested not only because I'm a Black woman and that is my end group, but when I looked at the statistics, right, the numbers, the facts, I am by, by training and by love um, a nerd. I was a research assistant in both undergrad and graduate school. And so I'm really, really big on numbers. And so when I started examining uh, let's say for instance, the group with the highest rate of maternal morbidity, right? Or when I started to examine who are the people in America that experience uh, the most mental health difficulties. So while 20% of Americans experience some sort of mental health dif difficulty or um, illness, of that 20%, half of those people in America are black, right? Um, and then when I learned that for Black women, we are what's considered to be doubly oppressed. So we not only operate in a space of patriarchy or um, isms, right, uh, sexism, but guess what? We have a second one, and that's racism. And so we have a very um, specific way of navigating the world that we live in. We have a very specific history um, in our country. And so when I started seeing the numbers like Black women are three times more as likely to be killed by their romantic partner than um, women of the dominant culture, right? Our white cohorts. And so Black women, their number one uh, killer is heart disease, right? So I was just astounded because guess what? Not only am I a Black woman, my daughter is, and my mother is, and my aunties and my sisters, you know? And so it was really right there in my face. Well, what can I do so that my family or women who identify with me or look like me um, are, are in need? What, what, what can I do? What is my part? 
Um, and so while I hold space for all women, um, cisgendered women, trans women, uh, our, Lat our Latinx women, like while I hold space for everyone, there is certainly a need for competent, culturally competent care for women who identify as African-American. And yeah. The, yeah, and I, I think it's so beautiful how you, I mean, all of those stats are horrific, um, yeah. but I think it's so beautiful how you got there and you also share sort of across a lot of media as well as in your book, Love Taps, again, which everyone should buy and share with your loved ones and children and every organization you're a part of. Um, you, you share that you also experienced trauma, um, not, unlike um, some of the trauma you're mentioning, are, are you okay talking through that here? Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so I, I guess, <laughs> let me phrase that as a question. <laughs> so see, so see, I, I guess the, the question is when you kind of gone through your own trauma um, that has to do with like a romantic partner and domestic abuse, mm -hmm. uh, how do you, get yourself from experiencing the trauma to helping others heal? The short answer for me was to do the work because I was very clear that unless I did the work, I wouldn't be able to support clients or patients in a healthy way. And it's so interesting how things worked out because I did not want to work with women who had experienced trauma. When I was in school, I was like, oh, I'm going to work with the worried well. And that's a term that's used to describe people that are high functioning, you know, doing pretty well. You know, maybe they have first world problems um, and we just keep it clean. Right. But, it, but what happened was when I was going in for my internship, the, 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 the place where I was supposed to do it was a college campus and something happened and I couldn't get it signed and I had to go with another site. And the site was a center for um, abused and uh, physically and sexually ass assaulted women. And I was like, okay, this is a joke. Like, this is really, really funny. The like universe. the universe, God, like, what are you doing? And it changed my life. It changed the trajectory of my path. And I'm so grateful for that experience. It gave me such a level of healing in my own right, but also um, a, a level of compassion and empathy. Um, and it was, it was life, life changing. And that is actually how that book came about because I'd noticed patterns and I saw the same thing, same thing. And I, and I was always educating um, women and I would have some men clients as well, but um, I was always educating them on signs that were not physical, right? Because when we talk about domestic violence, no one, you know, hits you in the face on the first date. There are all these other subtleties of mental manipulation that happen usually before the first physical instance. And so I said, hmm, I wonder if people know about what you know moving the go the goalpost looks like right and when i wrote that book gaslighting was not a buzzword i said i wonder what, what if people know what gaslighting looks like or love bombing or what the x the x factor is as i call it and so with that i said okay let's 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 make this a guidebook for people and every time somebody reads it they're just like oh my god I should have had this five years ago. I should, have, I should have had this with my sister, my cousin, my best friend, my coworker, my neighbor, you know, experienced this thing. So, yes. Um, w without, I mean, we want everyone to read the book, but I'll, <laughs> <laughs> let's define a couple of these things. So can you talk through what moving the goalpost is? Yes, I actually was explaining that um, just on yesterday. So mm -hmm. the goalpost, like if we think about, okay, let me, let me tell your audience, I'm not a sports person, so I'm going to do this the best <laughs> way I can. <laughs> so let's say you have that, um, the goalpost at the end of a football field and you have, I don't know, 10 more yards to go, or you have 10 yards to kick. 
Well, once you are like, yes, 10 yards, I make this, I get a point or I win the game, right? But as you're kicking it or when you kick it, they go, oh, not 20 yards is what's needed, right? So it's it's this false idea of a goal. And once that goal is met, you'll be loved, respected, and treated properly. And when the person meets that goal, whether it's having dinner on the table, when the partner comes home, whether it's being very quiet so the partner can sleep in on a Saturday morning, even when that's done, there's always another problem. And usually when they move a goal post, the stakes are higher. So now I not only need a meal when I come home, I need a meal and I need dessert and I need the kids to be in bed. Yeah. And so literally it, it, it's so elusive. It's like that carrot. You're never going to get to it. Never. Yeah. And I, it, that has to feel so terrible. I mean, I mean, I think a lot of people hearing that can think about a relationship you've been in where that has been a, a part of it. Mm-hmm. Hopefully we've all gotten out mm-hmm. <laughs> and moved yeah. beyond that, but it feels so terrible to think that you're not deserving of love in that moment um, because you just can't meet that person's expectations. Yeah. You, you, unfortunately you internalize it. And that's the point because the, the point is to make you the victim, whomever you are um, as a person, feel like you are the issue and you are the cause, you are the genesis of this behavior. And that's what the abuser does to their target. They make the target believe that if you could just fix yourself, we'd be all good. The problem. And we're going to talk a lot about gaslighting later. Um, (laughs) So I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but let's talk about love bombing. I think what's I want to hear your definition, but what I love about love bombing is it can be used for good. Mm-hmm. Um, what I don't love about love bombing for good like yes. on reality TV shows. Yes. <laughs> what, yeah. <everybody. laughs> so let's talk about that. Cause I, I did a, a feature for uh, the knot. And one of the things that I explained was, you know what, there's a, there's a huge difference in between flattery and a compliment. So flattery, if I want to flatter you, I am trying to decide what I want to do or tell you, right? I've kind of sized you up. So I'm deciding what to tell you in order to um, gain some sort of access, right? Where a compliment is a very benign, um, you know, it could be, it could be a sentence. It could be, you know, something that you're verbalizing. It could be a smile, whatever that thing is, it's benign and there's no ulterior motive but flattery is very much so and when we think about love bombing I like for people to think about flattery and not compliments because flattery looks like oh my god you are like the best person in the world like really am I the best person in the world or like what do you want from me right but if I said oh my gosh Gina your um your interviewing skills in the podcast were so conversational. I really enjoyed myself, right? Like it's, it's based in fact and truth. And so love bombing, a part of that is also, I become all of what you desire. I've probably watched you in some way. I've probably listened in those early conversations where you spilled your guts to me. And I am now becoming the thing and the person that you said you wanted or you didn't want. And now I'm doing all of the things that maybe you wanted this person to do in the hopes of you giving me access to you, to your mind, your heart, your pocket, your home, your children. Yeah. Love bombing is a scary one. You can, it is it, a very scary one. Because they, you don't see it coming, right? Yeah, you don't see it coming. And 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 again, and you said the the perfect word earlier, you said education. Because most people are when we talk to our children or when we were you know spoken to by our parents or guardians, no one explained to us, here are some of the things that people who don't have your best interest at heart, here are some of the things that they will do, right? Because we're told that gestures like flowers, you know, the person that was um, abusive to me in my teenage years wrote me poetry, um, would bring me flowers all the time, gifts, jewelry, right? So we're told that those things 
symbolize love and our accurate portrayals of a person's intentions, right? That's what we're told. We're not told to look beyond to see, does my body feel safe? My gut right? instinct. Yeah, when we are not taught to trust our gut, trust your, your gut will almost you know, sometimes it's, it's gas. I'm just going to put that out there, <laughs> but your gut, right? Your intuition essentially will never lead you. We always know we can just feel mm. it. Right. But what I'm finding, um, in most of the cases, it's usually a woman because we are giving, given the fantasy, but what I'm finding is that, um, my sisters, and I'm not just using that in, in a, a, a black uh, colloquial, but I'm saying, my, my, the women I work with, right, where it's a sisterhood, is that we are so sold on the fantasy. We are so socialized to believe that we are not complete unless we have someone that when our gut says, mm, I don't know about this person, we go, but, but if I just give it time, if I just, just, if I just give it time and I'm here to tell you that time does not correct behavior, intervention in work and introspection, correct behavior. What time does do is time will give you more of an investment and you'll be less likely to leave, right? It will prolong the exit. It will prolong you protecting yourself. It will prolong you listening to that still voice that you tend to quiet. So no, 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 not more time. Mm -mm. Time to go. <laughs> time, time to, to go. go. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we could talk about that, that one, honestly, all day, uh, because we probably have all been love bombed and we've all been in a situation where we're asking ourselves the question, like, will this person he or she will they ever love me? Uh, mm -hmm. when really what we should be asking ourselves is, do I feel safe? Do I love this yes. person? Yes. Do I feel safe? Does this person honor my boundaries or do they, you know, push and try to get me to kind of scoot, right. To just shift a little bit. Well, why don't you, you know I mean? Eh, it's not a big deal if you don't want to have sex, but I'm saying, you know, like it's, it's so subtle, but so loud if you know what it looks like. And so I hope that your listeners that some of this is resonating and kind of pinging in their own intuition. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about the X factor. Um, what is the X factor and how does one recognize it? Oh, the X factor. Actually, <laughs> I love the song by Lauren Hill. Mm -hmm. And, um, but the X factor is when your new partner makes their comments and questions. I'm sorry, excuse me. The X factor is when all of their comments Anything that they say about their ex, the ex is always crazy. The ex is the one that's the problem. The ex, the breakup was all the ex's fault, right? Because that's a couple of things. But here's what, I, what I've seen, right? So you can take this as anecdotal, but here's what I've seen. Um, I used to go to court with victims. And when I would go to court with victims, the perpetrator, and for the sake of statistics, because most often times the perpetrators are male, I'm just going to use that for this example. So I'll go to court and almost every time uh, the, the guy would come in, he would have a new partner. Like he would come to court with his new girlfriend. Ooh. And so what the girlfriend would always say, because they got something to say all the time is that the person I was with, my client, is crazy, right? She keeps calling. She did this. She did that. Oh, okay. So she's crazy by herself, right? These behaviors are unsolicited by him is what, you're, is what you think because he's told you she's crazy when really he's been um, leading her on. He's been breadcrumbing her right? He's been leaving these little teeny things to make her think that there's interest there. They may be, you know, they may still be sexually involved, but the new partner has no idea of this. Or you meet somebody and they go, yeah, my ex, um, he was, he just, you know, he's just crazy. Like he just said stuff. And if you ever run into him, you know, don't talk to him, you know, 
and the breakup was his fault. And it's like, so you aren't even taking any ownership. I don't care how a relationship, a relationship ends. There's always ownership on both parts, right? So even if a relationship is abusive, so maybe the target or the victim's take is, I needed to work on some things in myself and I didn't leave, right? That's ownership in the relationship. I didn't take care of myself. I didn't value myself. I stayed because I saw my mom do it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So even, you know, in the healthiest relationships, it's both person's contribution. So if, you're, if your partner is saying that their ex is all to blame and they don't have any accountability, that's a red flag. If your ex is saying, oh my God, if you see Sheila, run. She's nuts. Mm, is she? Is she really? You just not want me to talk to Sheila. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Bam. There you yeah. go. Ugh. Um, I, in college, I used to call that the, there is always an asshole behind every crazy person. Um, I, I'm just saying. Uh, <laughs> all right. Let's talk about, let's talk about treating trauma. We've talked about sure. a few different kinds of trauma. Uh, big T trauma, little T trauma, and, and also domestic uh, violence. Uh, how does one, where do you begin um, to scratch the surface on this? Okay. So my recommendation is you always want, um, cause every clinician has their specialty. Mm-hmm. Uh, every clinician has their niche. And so I always recommend that you see someone who is experienced, trained, or certified in treating trauma because there are some nuances that other conditions uh, don't have. And so if you are treating someone and you think that maybe they just have insomnia, but really they had a break-in three months ago, right? There's some hyper arousal there that needs to be reduced or eliminated before you can even get into healthy sleep hygiene. So you want someone who is trained and experienced um, and even certified in some trauma modalities that can assess, right? Proper assessment is always key, um, but also the treatment and the aftercare. Um, And you and I spoke, see, privately, I, I shared with you that I had actually sought um, therapy finally, um, for sexual assault in my teenage years when I was third, two years ago, right at the Mm -hmm. end of 2019. Mm -hmm. And I went through EMDR, which I felt was an incredible tool, um, that I never, I I never would have thought that moving my eyes. (laughs) It's the bees. It's like the bees knees. I love it. Cause that's actually what got me through my own trauma was, was EMDR. It it's, it, it is so effective for the really hard stuff. I, I'm, I'm totally right there with you. And I know um, a lot of soldiers returning from war have mm-hmm. been um, put through EMDR as well. So it's, it's been scientifically, you know, checked and validated. Mm-hmm. We know you love data. Mm-hmm. <laughs> See? So I don't think you would try something and talk about it if it weren't validated. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, for those who aren't familiar, EMDR is eye movement reprocessing. And what happens is you are led by a train. You have to be certified to, um, to provide EMDR. Uh, and you are led by a clinician, uh, in bilateral stimulation. Sometimes this happens with, I think you said you did it with your eyes, right? So you probably had the, okay. So you had tappers. Yep. So um, there's an, uh, an eye machine. There's also the tappers. Some people can do it with butterfly taps for yourself. I did it with the butterfly taps or uh, rocking from side to side. You can do it with a ball, but what it's doing is as you're accessing those memories and you're being led by, by the clinician, you're accessing those trauma capsules and you are uh, reprocessing what has happened. So now you have both parts of that brain, your emotional and your logical brain activated as you're reprocessing those memories. And for me, I think it was like 10, 10 sessions. I went from not being able to even speak about the trauma mm. without weeping to mm. actually being able to say the sentence um, that I said at the beginning of this, uh, sec- I w- was a victim of sexual assault. Like that yeah. is 
a miracle. (laughs) So so I, I would say it's, it is worth looking into if you've gone through any form of trauma that's still impacting your day to day. I'm so happy for your healing. I love that. Thank you. (laughs) Um, And I am, if you're watching the video version, I am getting a little choked up, but I'm getting choked up because I'm like happy. (laughs) It's, it's, it's very liberating. Yeah. You no longer feel like you're a prisoner to something that you likely had no control over. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you went through this too, but like walking down the street and looking over your shoulder, that hypervigilance, it's just exhausting. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely exhausting um, mentally and emotionally. Your body gets tired. Mm -hmm. Your body, your body is always probably tense when you're, you know, so yeah, definitely. Let's talk about brain spotting too. Cause I know, um, last time we spoke, see, you mentioned that <gasps> you were getting, talk about it. You were getting certified in that. Oh my God. It. So <laughs> I had it, um, I had the training this, this weekend. It's about 30 hours. It was very intense. Um, so I finished phase one. I'm gonna have the next phase next month and, in um, brain spotting, you, you have to be trained, um, but you don't have to be certified, but I'm, I'm going for certification. So with brain spotting, instead of it being where your eyes are being led by either that, uh, I can't remember the name of the the machine that they use or the tappers, right? Or the clinician, excuse me. This This is the clinician tapping into the way your eyes are naturally gazing as you are talking about things that activate you. And so the, the brain stores trauma in these neurons that have fired together during your traumatic incident, they form these capsules. And so with the eye movement, and I'm noticing your gaze when you're talking about something, like if you kind of look up, if you look down, those are access points. And so I don't have my pointer, I left it at the office, but I would show you, but with a pointer, if I had an ink pen, I could probably show you too, but guess what, don't have one of those. Oh, here we go. So if I have my pointer and you are fixed on this spot, I I, want to see what spot activates you the most. It is literally like the floodgates open. And it was so remarkable today. I had, um, you know, someone that came in that normally they're, um, they have what we call poverty of speech. Meaning if I don't ask you a question, you don't have much to say, but they talk the entire session. It was phenomenal. And so you're taking them from a place of rest into activation, rest into activation. And as we go back and forth between the two, the distance between those two points closes and we become not activated anymore. It's, I mean, the the training itself, I was in a group with 80 other therapists. All of us were like, you have to go through demos and practicum. We come out of practicum like exhausted because we've been crying the whole time. It was crazy. (laughs) So how does one find a a clinician who's trained in brain spotting? Um, I believe that if you go to brainspotting.com, there is a, um, a list, like you can maybe search your own area. Google always works brain spotting capital A and D your location and you probably can can locate a couple of um, clinicians and one thing I'll say about brain spotting versus the EMDR brain spotting is um, black indigenous and persons of color um, appropriate because it's an adaptive form where you are able to just kind of lead And you leave, like you are, if you think of a comet, you are the head of the comet and the clinician is following behind you. And so you get to use your own autonomy to go wherever it is you need to go, right? Um, As you're receiving this sort of um, treatment. So it's a very uh, liberating and beautiful process. It sounds incredible. We'll, we'll link to that in the show notes. So we'll make sure everybody who is listening can find a clinician. If you're interested in both EMDR or brain spotting, um, mm-hmm. I know it's been challenging for a lot of folks who are looking to heal right now to find a clinician or a therapist, but, um, we can do our best, um, to find one for you. See, are you totally booked up by the way? Yes. At your practice? Yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, I mean, that's, a wonderful thing, but that's also like 
Thank yeah. you, pandemic. <laughs> yeah, I um, I've actually I'm compiling a list of referrals for my states of licensure, so that when people reach out, um, if they don't mind, you know, maybe speaking with another clinician, I can refer them. But for those who are like, no, I want to talk to you, which is cool too. I do have a waiting list on my website. Great. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Let's talk about language. Um, we, we've defined a lot of terms as we're chatting here, but mm -hmm. there are some ways that language hurts us too, yeah. uh, because we've, we've started redefining words that clinicians, therapists yes. are using every day and people actually need that language to, yes. to heal. Um, so I know a couple that you and I talked about see are triggers, gaslighting and, and narcissists, but there might be mm -hmm. more, um, mm -hmm. but let, let's start with triggers. Yeah. Like those are the, those are the buzzwords. So triggers, mm -hmm. um, usually cl clinically refer to, uh, a stimulus, um, that precipitated some sort of episode, right? Um, and so now we use it when people are sad because you treated them really crappy. Or now we use that word to describe behavior when you want to diminish somebody's experience, right? It's become a word to use to really minimize how you affect other people. Oh, you're triggered because I said that your shoes are ugly. You know what I mean? Like it's become so mean it's become really mean um particularly on social media i don't always see it used in a way of oh i watched this show and it triggered some memories for me it's it's always used in a way that doesn't necessarily connect to one's emotional and mental well-being and i think that that is where the word becomes negatively charged and harmful. Mm -hmm. I know we have some readers who um, will reach out to us when I would say on the positive side, what I like about having language around triggers is mm -hmm. that we have some readers that will, or ambassadors or just community members who will reach out to us and say, X, Y, or Z triggered me and here's why. Yeah. Um, and it allows us to do better in the future. Um, but just like you're saying, we see it used as a joke too. Yeah, yeah. And so when, like you said, when you get the feedback and they can say, hey, this thing triggered me, they're probably talking about their emotional or their mental right? They're not talking about something that is a joke or something that is um, benign. Like it just, I can't even, it's like my brain just won't even let me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Uh, let's talk about gaslighting. Um, oh, gaslighting. <laughs> so, you know, so I just a little bit of history. It's in my book as well, but gaslighting was a movie. It was called the gaslight. And in the movie, this, uh, this woman's husband is manipulating the lighting in the home so that she believes that she is, you know, sh surely, but slowly going insane. And he's doing this because there's like, I think he's having an affair and there's money involved. It's a really, it's a great movie. It was, it's old, but it's a really good, I love black and white movies. Don't judge me. <laughs> um, but that's where the term comes from. And essentially what the term means in the clinical sense is that there is someone who is intentionally and purposely acting to cause you to question your own reality and experiences, okay? Literally, I've had people come in and say, I walked in the room and my purse was there. I walked out, it was gone. And then I, I looked for it. He helped me look for it. And I came back and it was there. And he was like, you're so stressed lately, right? Because those behaviors later on set up a field for him to make her question the, the abuse. Okay. So how I hear gaslighting being used is if someone says something to you, and you in turn say, it was hurtful when you said those things to me. Like, oh, you're gaslighting me. No, I'm telling you how I feel. And I think you're trying to avoid ownership in your behavior. That's very different. Okay. Or if someone says, um, oh, 
You know, that's not what happened. Oh, you're gaslighting me. No, that's not a gaslight. A lot of times we perceive things very differently. So your experience is not going to match up with my experience. We can see the same car crash and your experience be very different, but we still saw the same car crash, right? So our difference in recall of the event is not necessarily intentional manipulation um, or gaslighting, if that makes sense. It sounds like the intent is the is really the underlying thing for gaslighting. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> remember, abusers are very methodical and systematic in all that they do. It's not by happenstance. It's scarier every time you think about mm -hmm. it. All right. Speaking of abusers, um, mm -hmm. no, that not necessarily a perfect segue, but let's talk about narcissists. <laughs> in an imperfect segue. <laughs> Gina is so funny. <laughs> I love it. Um, so, oh, this is like the bane of my clinical <laughs> existence at this point, because the word about four years just took off. And clinically, we are speaking about um, antisocial personality dis disorder, histrionic personality disorder, and um, narcissistic personality disorder. And that group is a cluster. Um, in the DSM, that particular group of personality disorders, um, the criteria are very specific. They're very, very, very clear. And um, it speaks of someone that not only lacks the ability um, of empathy, but they've likely had uh, an abusive or abandoned childhood. Um, and I don't have the criteria in front of me, forgive me, but I just wanna name a few things. Um, also, they, they do not believe that the law of the land applies to them. Um, and so there's a whole, I, I wish I had it in front of me. I do not, um, you know, uh, forgive me, but I want to just kind of tell you that, but then how the word narcissist is used. Oh my gosh, she only thinks of herself or he only thinks of, of himself. He's so narcissistic. Well. Maybe they're just self-centered. That's still a thing, right? Um, or like, he was so rude to me. He didn't even um, say goodbye. He's such a narc. Um, he's probably just a jerk or a crappy person. They do exist, right? We have to be very careful because a, a true, first of all, a true narcissist blends in you would not recognize it. You would not recognize the behavior unless you were educated and had experienced it for yourself. You would not, it's so subtle. It's so subtle and it's methodical. And the average person would not be able to point it out. Yeah. Um, and so that's why, again, books like uh, The Narcissist Next Door. Yeah. Books like um, Psychopath Free, right? The book that I've written that's a more condensed version of, of this, this um, education uh, and information. Um, you would not be able to recognize it right offhand. It's so scary to just even think about like, so I always caution people, hey, I need for you to separate that word um, and really talk about what the behavior is. Let's talk about what you're seeing. Well, I mean, you know, I, um, we had a date and he canceled and I was like, oh my God, that's so narcissistic of you. He, honey, he had work. I mean, I don't know what to tell you, but that's not, <laughs> that's not, that's, he doesn't have MPD. He doesn't have a personality disorder, okay? Yeah. All right. We're all going to stop using these words <laughs> unless, unless we have a real reason <laughs> to feel triggered, gaslit, or yeah. uh, let's just not say narcissist. Because guess what? Every crappy person you meet, every jerk you meet is not a narcissist. And every narcissist that you come into contact with does not present as a jerk. You probably, if anything, you're going to think that they're like, the best thing ever is what you're going to think in the beginning. So guess what? Yeah, you probably haven't really met one yet. So just be careful. 
they blend in. They're chameleons. Mm-hmm. Yes. All right. I'm going to switch gears to you uh, okay. because, because I worry about you <laughs> in the caregiving, the loving, the healing field. I think all of you are so overworked right now. Um, mm. And so I want to know, see what you do to take care of yourself um, doing all of this work. Gina, say <laughs> That's why we vibe, honey. That's why we vibe. <laughs> I love it. So, so for me, um, I had to develop a self-care practices very early, right? Not only because of the work that I did, but because of my own trauma and because of my own healing. So for me to be able to continue to grow, evolve and heal I, and sustain, it's, it's important that I take care of myself. It's almost like if you had someone that maybe went through some sort of physical repair in their body and you want to keep that repair you want to be very careful about what you do from now on and so personally personally for me I love a good spa day like it's life for me but what's also life for me is my quiet time and the time that I spend meditating and the time that I spend connecting with my highest self the time that I spend with my spouse um, my ability to say no I said no to a couple of uh, speaking engagements today. Cause I just, my calendar was as full as I would like it to be. Because when you do this work, not just in a clinical capacity, but, um, in a teaching capacity or, uh, speaking, it's important that I can show up fully as me. Right. And so in order for me to show up as fully as me, meaning I know the latest stats, I am well-versed in the topic. I am listening to the audience. I am compassionate and I can show up as my silly, smiley, high energy self. I got to say no to some things and that's okay. And the biggest thing for me was learning how to do that without guilt, not being responsible for anybody else's emotions. Um, I had a good friend that reached out to me. She wanted me to speak at a conference that she's hosting and my first inclination was oh you know that's a friend you know and then I said oh wait a minute that's my labor right that's my labor and so I deserve to be compensated for my labor and I think for women oh gosh we're such amazing amazing uh beings because we're always taught to put other people before ourselves meaning, you know, whatever that is, like, let's make sure this person is comfortable before we make sure that we're comfortable. And that is the quickest way to burn out. And that's the quickest way to not show up as the person you were created to be. And my mantra has been, I will not abandon myself for anything or anyone. I really like that. Is that, did someone cross the stitch that onto something for you? Cause I feel like that has to happen in your future. No, it may be a tattoo. It, okay. it, it may, it may become a tattoo. Yeah. Okay. That's, I was thinking tattoo, but I said cross stitch. I don't know. Go with your gut. Go with your gut. You're right. Right. Okay. So yeah. as we, as we close this down, I obviously, I want to talk to you all day, but also yeah. let's get you back to your life. Um, <laughs> t- tell our listeners where to find you, anything sure. you have coming up and promote everything. Sure. Sure. Um, so I have two websites. I like to keep my practice and my, my, uh, my clinic separate from my consulting and my speaking. And so the, the therapeutic and the clinical website is Revita, R-E-V-I-T-A therapy illness.com and my consulting site for all other matter matters uh media etc is c anderson live c e anderson l i v e.com my instagram is c anderson live my facebook is i think it's c anderson um twitter is also c anderson live and um that is where i where i reside on on the interwebs Find her everywhere. Um, and you'll also, as, as you're listening to this, uh, everywhere you get your podcasts, we'll link to C's books and all of those other places um, that you heard us mention. See, thank you so much for joining me. It was a pleasure. 
Gina, it's it's always a pleasure. I, I love the work that you're doing and you know, you just dial me up anytime. <laughs> Air kisses. I'm gonna stop the recording.